Eaten. Yeah. In this session, it is uh, tactical medicine, history, basics, and updates. And in chair, we have Mr. Ravi Ganesh, former Vice Admiral. We request Mr. Ravi Ganesh to be on the dais. Welcome, sir. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, the resource person is uh, Mr. Dov Meisel, Chief of Operations for the International Rescue Unit, Zaka Brussels. May we have you on the dais? Oh, yeah. Welcome. I'll take probably two minutes to introduce uh, the chair and the resource person, and then uh, hand it over to the chair to take the session forward. Mr. Uh, Ravi Ganesh, retired as Vice Admiral Officer with 40 years in Navy. He's a submarine specialist, has more than 35 years of experience in submarines. Commanded India's first nuclear submarine. Commanded INS Vikrant, India's Air Force carrier. He is operation, uh, he served in Somalia. He was Director General of the Coast Guard and Head of India's Nuclear Submarine. Currently Director of the Asia Center and Adjunct Faculty, NIAS Bangalore. That's uh, Mr. Ravi Ganesh for us. And Mr. Dov Meisel. Corporate Operational Manager with Substantial Medical Emergency Management Experience. National Level EMS Manager with broad experience in all aspects of medical first response, training, and medical management. He has direct vast experience with mass disaster, multi-casualty, and toxicological terrorism. He uh, was project manager, procedure developer in a wide variety of emergency medical applications, particularly for the field and hospitals in the disaster arena. Senior paramedic, civilian and military, veteran flight medic, experienced in international air medical service and uh, medivac rescue, intensive care unit, paramedic, and Director of Training Division for National First Response Unit of the National EMS Organization. Company Commander in the IDF, Home Front Command specializing in mass disasters, TAC Medic, Rescue and Recovery in the Civilian and Military Arena, and Weapons of Mass Destruction. Currently, Chief of International Operations, Zaka International Search and Rescue, Volunteer UN Recognized Humanitarian NGO, assisting in search and rescue operations of man-made and natural disasters worldwide. Expertise in fields of consulting, disaster preparedness, TCC, TEMS, MCI mass casualty incident, toxicological terrorism, weapons of mass destruction, hospital, EMS and community training, medical management, international aeromedicine, aeromedical assistance, international medical liaison. Very exhaustive uh, intro. Over to the chair. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's, uh, we're going to listen to a speaker with a unique uh, career profile for a man who started from modest beginnings in an ambulance service. He has risen to become the chief operations officer of an international of the international uh, company which provides search and rescue. Mr. Dov Mazel, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Correct. Mr. Dov Mazel has agreed to talk to us about a subject which is not very well known. I would go so far as to say it is not a subject that is very well, as a concept, is not very well thought about in India. Uh, and what is that subject? It is tactical medicine. A tactical sort of smell, sort of reminds one of the military or a military operation or armed forces operation and medicine is something else it is medical relief it is humanitarian and what then is tactical medicine ordinarily whenever any event occurs an accident a mishap or an attack or a major disaster it happens first and medical relief is a reactive process and it happens far away. That means people go in either to 
quell the disaster or to remedy the effects of the disaster and those who are injured and require medical relief are taken away from the scene back somewhere else where medical relief is available. Tactical medicine ends all that and takes the medical relief to the scene of the event, to the scene of action. And that is what is so very different. And so that is how somebody who was simply operating in an ambulance service had the vision to see that this has to grow into something much bigger and create medical relief facilities on the spot, the hot spot. Now, tactical relief and uh, medicine, medical relief at the scene of action is not easily provided. You have to have an organization, you need to have specially skilled people, you need to have the mobility. And this is what we hope to learn from Mr. Maisel's talk to us today. If, if conventionally, therefore, medical relief has been reactive, tactical medicine makes that as integral to the operation itself. Mr. Maisel? Cheers, yours. <laughs> Good morning, or almost good afternoon. First of all, I uh, would like to share with you my uh, gratitude to uh, you attending here, to uh, Synergia that are hosting us here. It's a unique opportunity, first of all, for me on a personal level, is a first visit to India, and I must say that this stay here in the past uh, three days has been uh, inspiring, inspiring to me uh, to see that there are amazing people I have not yet met such friendly people on and, and any, and any level, anywhere in the world, and this is very, very heartwarming, and thank you. Um, in this coming presentation, what I'd like to do is give you some food for the mind to think and look at the, the medical treatment from a little bit different perspective through a different prism to understand that in order to receive medical treatment in a combat zone, in a tactical situation, whether in a civilian arena or in the military, um, we're going to learn some tools of how we can mobilize this to actually save lives, which is our ultimate, uh, ultimate mission. So this is our intro. The definition of a, a tactical emergency medical is a, an out-of-the-hospital system of care dedicated to enhancing the probability of special operations, law enforcement, mission success, and promoting public safety. So let's just understand first the basic definitions, and then we'll start going through the presentation, and I will gladly take any questions addressed at the end. So TEMS and TCC. TEMS is Tactical Emergency Medical Support, and TCC, Tactical Combat Casualty Care. The difference between them, differentiating between them, is the civilian arena, meaning um, security forces, uh, law enforcement, police, special tactic units, and TCCC is more related to the combat field, the military arena, but the, the fundamental uh, points of this uh, uh, presentation, of the points of care, resemble each other very much, and this is what we want to talk about today. So the three objectives of TEMS, of Tactical Emergency uh, Medical Treatment, is, first of all, treat the casualty. What are we all here for? What are medics here for, paramedics, doctors? We want to save lives. That's our premier uh, uh, target. Obviously, if we're part of a special tactic police force unit, a elite unit, raiding a, a hostage situation, for instance, then we want, uh, first of all, to resolve the situation protect ourselves, protect our team members, and of course treat the uh, victims, whether the victims are civilians or whether the victims are from our own forces, and to complete the mission. What we want to do here basically is integrate the medical treatment into the operation itself. So the goals, the direct goals are to enhance mission accomplishment. That is the prior goal. We want to uh, uh, take out, the perpetrator take out the, uh, the person who's uh, causing the damage, causing the injuries, and uh, uh, complete the mission. Reduce, reduce death, injury, and illness and related effects among officers, innocent, and perpetrators. Meaning we're looking as when we treat the patient, 
It's irrelevant at the moment of treatment who we are treating, whether it's the perpetrator or the officer uh, uh, attacking the perpetrator or uh, civilians, uh, innocent bystanders. Improve the agency's po posture and liability prone circumstances, meaning the circumstances of an incident have uh, the ability to go beyond that specific incident. It could be political uh, effects. It could be uh, psychological effects to the community. We want to minimize this incident to the minimum and move forward. Reduce line of duty injury and disability costs to the agency. I know it sounds not nice to say that we're looking to cut costs, but uh, at the end of the day, um, the life saved is most important. And we'll see through this presentation how we can actually, with very basic skills, actually save lives in this. Reduce lost work time. Any person, a, an officer, a special unit, obviously in special units, it's not as many soldiers or policemen as you have on the street. These are specially trained, unique units, and every person is important there. So we want to minimize the time lost that they're out of mission. We need them back on the force as fast as possible. And maintain good team morale. Maintain good team morale when true concern for the member's health is realized. What does that mean? That means that if, God forbid, one of our team members is hit during action, it can essentially affect the morale of the team. We want to know that the team members, when going in, know that if something happens to them, they're in good hands, get the right treatment, and the odds are that they will survive this uh, uh, incident. Let's look at a little bit of numbers. Uh, just collected, uh, there are many studies done on uh, combat medicine and uh, um, operational medicine. And we can see that there are all kinds of different reasons, causes of death during action. I'd like to relate to three of them is, uh, first of all, 9% uh, uh, is uh, exsanguination, meaning this is treatment that there's nothing we can do. The person was killed, unfortunately, on the spot. There's nothing that we can do. The second one is airway obstruction, and the third one is a, a pneumothorax damage to the lungs and breathing system. What we do see is most important, and this is the focus of our uh, lecture, is that the, mass, the vast uh, majority of the victims uh, in these incidents die from some sort of hemorrhage. We found in research that many of these incidents, many of these uh, patients, and we'll see the numbers further down in the presentation, um, can actually be saved. So the most important thing is why did we, it's not me, I thank you for giving me the credit for it, sir, but um, it's not me who invented tactical medicine. Tactical medicine has no one protocol today, one standard of care worldwide. Rather, tactical medicine is an accumulation of experience from tactical units, from medical personnel around the world whether it's in the U.S., in, in, in NATO armies, in Israel, in India, anywhere in the world, basically, <clears throat> a lot of experience is gained in the combat field. <clears throat> and we're sort of in the midst of improving the system, improving the system in order to minimize the deaths. And the think tank idea, which Synergia brought here and brought us here uh, to speak, is exactly that, to share this knowledge so that when we meet again in a year, or in two years, we know to, to learn from each other and see what lessons you can actually teach us from your experience in the field. And therefore, this protocol is ongoingly uh, improving itself. So what are the preventable combat deaths? First of all, hemorrhage from extremities. What, are, what is hemorrhage from extremities? Arms, legs. Hemorrhage from extremities, 60% of, of, uh, of these uh, incidents ended up in death. And these are actually preventable, meaning if we stop the bleeding at that point, we stop the deterioration of the victim. Tension of thorax is damage to the lungs, to the airway, uh, to the lower airway system. And airway compromise is upper airway obstruction. These in total are 16% of total combat deaths. These 16%, here it says 16, we'll see further down that it can go up to 25% in total combat deaths, these deaths can actually be preventable with a few simple acts. So, what's the approach? How do we look at tactical medicine? First of all, we need to identify quickly in action. As it happens, we need to identify the, identify the cause of the, uh, of the uh, injury and uh, try and prevent uh, the deterioration. We need to address it aggressively. 
as opposed to treatment in a hospital or a clinic, which may take more time until you check, until you do examinations, send for an x-ray, go to the operating theater. Here, you need to work fast and, and practice very good medicine. You need to know how to work fast, effectively, and aggressively. We call it to attack the victim with good treatment. So what's the most important, here? The important thing here? First of all, we need to plan. We need to plan, we need to plan different scenarios. Any incident, if we're going, if there's a tactical unit now preparing for some sort of incident, obviously they sit down with the maps of the site where they're going, they have a whole tactical uh, program there, how they're going to invade this, uh, this uh, hostage situation, how they're going to control it, etc. Very important when we're talking about tactic medicine is in this scenario planning, we need to actually make a plan of what happens along the way, where the uh, uh, risk areas, the higher risk areas here of getting struck and prepare ourselves and the medical staff in the team how to respond. Um, the location of the uh, tactical and medical personnel, um, I'll say again, tactical medical personnel is not an outside person integrated in the team. It's one of the team members which is actually trained on the medical aspects. So it, it, we need to think according to the plan where we want to position our uh, medical responder. Um, we need to predict what are the medical problems that we can uh, imagine that will happen in this incident. We got to think of where this incident is. Is it out in the open, in the closed vicinity? Are there hazardous materials involved, etc.? Different risks that we need to take into consideration when making the plan. Obviously, this approves the public opinion because once we reduce the casualties, the fatalities in these incidents, obviously the public look at the forces as much more effective. They look highly at the special units anyway, but they'll even look higher at them if they manage to reduce the fatalities in these incidents. And obviously reduce the liability. When I say reduce of liability, that is in, a, in a different uh, political situations or, or sensitive situations. Uh, like I said, technical medicine is not uh, designated only for terror or uh, it could be domestic uh, a person who is upset that the authorities took his kids to welfare or whatever and he decides to take hostages and, uh, and, and threaten and tactic unit wants to invade the house and uh, uh, get this perpetrator. So we need to make plans of how we're going to evacuate if we have a victim in the incident. Not think of it only in, in when it happens. We need to think ahead of time what are the difference uh, what are the different situations that we may need to uh, work with? Evidence preservation. If you have an ambulance come to a crime scene, obviously the ambulance has no idea what to do in a crime scene as far as what's interest afterwards, the forensics and the investigation of the incident. So these tactical units are trained anyway in evidence pre preservation. Very important. This way the medical response gives the treatment on the scene and uh, preserves as best as possible, obviously, the uh, evidence. Um, Barricade medicine, that's uh, relating to the second round, uh, second circle of treatment. Remote physical assessment is with our minimal, we'll go into it in depth, but the minimal equipment that we have, we've got to remember once we go in, what is on us is what we have to deal with. We don't have inventory with us. Um, extrication and evacuation, and let's go for it. Extrication is, of course, taking the patient out in different situations. There are situations in, uh, that may uh, involve patients that are trapped in different conditions. It could be a, as a result of a, a local disaster, accident, or whatever it is. Um, okay. We need to prepare for the unexpected. I think that's the most important thing when relating to tactical medicine is we need to prepare ourselves to deal with situations. Obviously, like I said, we need to make a plan but there's always, a, 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 like I say, the patients never read the textbook of medicine. They make up on their own. So also life, life situations bring, um, bring uh, challenges. If you make challenges to us that we need to deal with as we go on, meaning the tactical medic needs to be able to think out of the box, not just to read the protocol and, uh, and, and, do, and do that. So maintain emotional composure, very important for the provider, the tactical medic, doctor, paramedic, whatever it is, responding in the incident to not get involved emotionally and deteriorate the emotional situation of the victim. He needs to be able to be focused on the mission and accomplish. 
good rapid triage. Triage, uh, if, uh, for who, those who don't know, is uh, differentiating the different situation of the medical condition and therefore making the plan of treatment. So the specialized training um, basically has a few basic elements that they need to know. As opposed to a regular physician, doctor, or medic in an ambulance on the street, um, the tactical medic needs to be aware and a be able to comprehend threat assessment, medical intelligence, have sort of a sixth sense in the, in the, when approaching the, the patient. They need to know how to treat patients under fire. They need to know how to deal with hostage survival. Obviously, if we're raiding a hostage situation, then they, they need to know how to do best in order to preserve life of the hostages, which is the ultimate mission of the unit going in. Um, evidence collection, clinical forensics, um, how weapons work, what their effects are in deeper depth, because might I remind you, they're not inside the operating theater in the hospital where they have a, a time to research and do whatever they want. Um, different toxic hazards, they need to be aware of a, a chemical, biological weapons of mass destruction, because you discussed this yesterday, um, and it's a global threat today of toxicological terrorism. When the teams are going in, they need to be aware of situations that can involve uh, toxical chemical uh, agents that can affect the team uh, treating them. So historically, um, combat medical training it was modeled from, they took what was done in the civilian arena, what the ambulances knew how to do on the street or the hospitals, clinics knew how to do. They said, okay, we'll take that and do it in the uh, tactic uh, military combat arena. Obviously, um, this uh, created sort of a problem because the challenges in the field are much more comprehensive than uh, what they have to deal with in their natural vicinity. Um, so when we look at tactical medicine, the basic people who would be doing this would be people who are pre-trained with some sort of medical background, whether they're physicians or medics, paramedics, whatever it is. And we add all the different elements that are important to know beyond that. So let's stop a second and think. We're talking about the medical world, and we're talking about the tactical military a law enforcement world, which are armed, etc. So let's think about this, this thought a second of having a doctor with a gun. It's a, conceptually, it's something that uh, we need to look at the pros and cons for it. So first of all, if a doctor has a gun, and we're not just talking about any doctor on the street, obviously, we're talking about a doctor in a special situation as part of a law enforcement or military team. Um, if the doctor is armed, then there is a then basically they know the basic rules of weapons, um, how to deal with weapons, they're more aware of how to protect themselves, etc. Um, there is um, less, sorry, there is less threat, direct threat to the doctor or medic treating the patient because he can protect himself. Um, they don't need special additional training on weaponry, etc. because they are integrated from the tactical units and uh, they don't have to stand liability of using of the use of deadly weapons. Um, let's think about what happens, why we should think not to provide these, um, uh, uh, these weapons to, to integrate the, the medics with the weapons. Because first of all, a medic that's unarmed is a threat to the team. Because if you need to protect the team member, that is a medic, you're already losing one of the team members that can be attacking the, the target. Um, it's more difficult for the medical treatment to be provided safely within the perimeter if you're not armed. And obviously, if the medic or doctor are armed, they're able to protect themselves and the victim that they're treating, whether it's a colleague from their tactic unit or whether it is a hostage. Another reason for providing these weapons to these uh, uh, tactical unit um, providers, it, like I said, protects the patient, protects the, the medic himself. Um, very important is limited manpower. When dealing with an incident, 
I, I'll keep going over these things because these are the important points uh, that, we go, that we go home with today after this lecture, is protecting ourselves, protecting the patient, taking the liability off of other team members, enabling them to complete their mission. Therefore, we're actually assisting in completing the mission while we're not dealing with the medical treatment. We are, as part of the tactic team, attacking the mission. And at the end of the day, we want to get out of there safe. The team members, the uh, hostages, and the, obviously we want to get the perpetrators. So, what are the phases in uh, tactical medicine? Um, tactical medicine, or combat uh, scenarios, uh, entitle um, different complex situation. We want to have the best outcome uh, at the end of this mission, meaning, obviously, zero fatalities as best as possible. If there are no casualties, that's even better, and the team can fulfill their mission. Um, but the basic is good medicine can be bad tactics, and bad tactics will cause the mission to fail. Therefore, it is important to combine the right thing at the right time and in the right place. So we divide the tactical medicine into three phases. The first phase, obviously, is during the gunfight. While we're under fire, we need to know how to react, how to treat the patient, protect ourselves, protect the patient, and get him out of there. As the threat decreases, we can go on and treat the patient more extensively and more in depth, and we'll see the three stages. So first of all, while the care is under fire, that's stage one. Stage two is the tactical field care. Tactical field care, uh, we'll go into depth in a second what exactly that uh, entails, and the tactical, tactical evaluation care. So care under fire is as, as simple as it sounds. While the gunfight is going on between the terrorist perpetrators and the law enforcement, there is a casualty. He needs to be attended to immediately. We'll soon go through the process of uh, how we approach these patients, what are the things that we do, what are the uh, basic um, procedures that we need to do. And uh, we're limited at this point. We've got to remember that what we went into the mission with, the kit on our back, the kit on our leg, that's all we have. And we can't look back to see where is the storage room or where is the higher ranking doctor or anyone back there. It's us, and it's us alone. So we need to think about that stage. Um, the tactical field care is once the gun, gun fighting stopped, there's no fighting at the moment, but the situation is just being maintained, meaning at any given moment, the situation can deteriorate again, and the gunfight can start, and the life-threatening situation is once again on the highest alert. So, once the gunfighting is stopped, we did the first preliminary actions while gunfight, now the gunfighting is under control. We can go on, do the next stage of treatment, and take into consideration we need to get out of there as fast as possible because in any moment, at any given time, the hostile situation can regain itself. And the evacuation care uh, relates more to the third circle. When relating to uh, tactical medicine, it's not only, only relating to uh, dense populated areas where you have the hospital around the corner. Many of these incidents, uh, primarily in the uh, battlefield, can be in remote areas. So we need to take into consideration evacuation uh, uh, mode, whether it will be with a helicopter, a boat, um, on foot, on motorcycle, whatever we have, whatever resources we have, whatever we have to work with, we need to take that into consideration as the third level when we make the pre-planning of the incident. We need to take that into consideration and think how we're going to end up getting this patient to definitive care in a hospital primarily the operating theater, where, there is, where they can actually save his life. So, pre-hospital trauma care in tactical setting is very different from working in the civilian arena, first of all, primarily because of the threat to the uh, provider and the patient. Tactical environmental factors have a profound impact on trauma care rendered in the battlefield. Good medicine can be bad tactics, that's why we've got to keep in mind when we go through the next stages what good medicine is, maintaining good tactics. And going back to the numbers, is up to 24, 25% of these injuries 
rendered during combat, whether combat in a combat field or in a tactical situation, can be, the deaths can be prevented by immediate actions taken by the tactical unit member. It is very important that once there's a man down, he gets immediate care, even under fire, of course, taking the precautions. If they, they're shooting all over there and you can't make it through, you're not going to go in. You've got to maintain. If, you, if you're dead, you're not going to be able to help your colleague. That's something to remember. Um, and what we'll do now is basically try to give the tools of how to work with this. So what's the difference here? Trauma care settings in different settings. If we look, we can see the hospital where you have the operating theater, the bed, your equipment on the walls, anything you need. You can consult with a colleague physician that's with you. You can have six nurses helping you by the table there, and you just ask for the things, and you do what you do. When you're in the field, you're on your own. There are many different circumstances working in the field, and that's what we're going to be talking about. So, the differences in care. First of all, remote assessment. You've got to do a quick, brief, fast assessment of the patient. Tactical exam is you've got to be doing this while you're taking into consideration the security threats around you. Um, you don't want to overload an assessment. You do it very basic. Um, inner perimeter, basically, we provide basic life support operations. We don't start doing surgery in the battlefield under fire. We're talking about, remember, the three stages. We'll do the advanced life support procedures in the second stage or in the third stage. Um, there's no CPR conducted in a, in, a hosti in, in a hostile situation. CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, what you all know as uh, basically uh, heart compressions. And uh, airway is only done partially in the area to maintain airway and bring them out to stage two and stage three. We need to determine... Oh, sorry. We need to determine... First of all, if the area is secured, like I said, if we're going into a hot zone, we need to make sure we won't be killed. Once we're dead, we're ineffective, and we're a burden to the team. Um, we need to determine if the patient is a perpetrator threat. Why? Why do we need to determine if the victim is the perpetrator or if he's one of us? Very simple. If he's a perpetrator, he might be holding a gun, and he sees us as one of the tactic team members. The first thing he'll do is pull out that gun and kill us. So we need to remotely, quickly make an evaluation. Is he a threat or not? Um, we need to determine the level of the injury in order for us to know how to react. Um, we need to assess risk benefit of exposing providers in an unsecured area. I'll remind you, we need as fast as possible to do the basic procedures and pull out to stage two and stage three. And we need to do basic stabilizing procedures in order to get our patients out alive. So the tactical approach basically gives us a few tools we need to take into consideration. Like we said, we're not in the operating theater. Um, many cases, we might be in a dark room. All tactical units, or most of the tactical units around the world in any law enforcement, first thing they do before they attack is cut the power, make the room dark so that the terrorist, the perpetrator, will be blinded so they can go in with their equipment, with their special uh, night goggles or whatever it is, um, night vision, or, a, or throw in a, 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 a grenade to stun, a stunning grenade to stun the perpetrator, enabling them to take over the situation. Um, when you approach the patient, you need to approach him and identify yourself as a rescuer. Because if it's a colleague of yours that made the first entry, breaking in, and was shot, and he's on the floor, and you come up to him, you don't want him accidentally shooting you. So you identify yourself. Obviously, every country has their own uh, code words, Every unit has their code words, but you have to identify yourself in order to maintain safety for yourself. You've got to position yourself near the head of the patient in order to make an assessment of the airway, breathing. You can hear if it's dark. You can hear if he's breathing. You can look at his chest and, uh, and get an, a rough assessment of what the situation is. Um, it gives you an assessment of the level of consciousness. Um, and, of course, rapid tactical whole body survey. Just check down the person quickly to try and identify where he's been hit in order to provide the good treatment. So what are the concerns? Obviously, the most basic fundamental concern is being shot. So we want to make sure that we're safe, 
Darkness can be a concern. Environmental factors. Where is this incident taking place? Is it in a house? Is it on the street? Is it in a um, chemical plant? Is it in any different situations? We know that the uh, chemical plants and different uh, strategic targets for terrorists can be uh, uh, very dangerous to us as providers while treating the patient. During gunfire, the gunfight, there can be ob obstruction of some sort of chemical device there. It doesn't have to be a terrorist medical device. It could be just some sort of tank with chemical, it could be in a factory, whatever, with some chemical materials there that can uh, affect uh, you and the patients. We know to consider that it will take time to get the definitive care. This is not the patient on the street which we throw on the ambulance and rush to the hospital. We need to know that it will take more time. Um, and we need to act in a command, uh, in a chain of command and command decisions like in a law enforcement or military fashion. So, basics, you are one of the team members, you are a tactical fighter, primarily, you are a medic as well, but if you're being shot at, first of all, you shoot back in order to protect yourself and if there is any other victim there. Um, if the victim is one of your team members and he is capable of return and fire, I don't need to tell him to do that, he'll probably do it on his own. But it's just things to take into consideration that you are the medic, but you're still one of the team members in the mission. Keep yourself from getting shot. Keep the casualty from getting shot. And stop life-threatening hemorrhage. We'll keep coming back to the hemorrhage. Um, tourniquets, we'll talk a few words about that as well. Um, and as fast as possible, evacuate to a secure area. So, like I said, controlling the hemorrhage is the top priority. Um, statistics taken from American Army um, in Vietnam primarily was the turning point of, a, of starting to use tourniquets more excessively. There were more than 2,500 casualties, fatalities, as a result of bleeding from extremities. These are bleeding that have, could have been prevented and stopped and prevented the deterioration of the patient um, and possibly even saved their life. So, tourniquets. When we talk about cardiopulmonary resuscitation, CPR, there's a study made once, this has nothing to do with tactical medicine, this is sheer medicine, there was a, a, a study done that out of 138 patients, trauma patients, not cardiac patients, people that were involved, whether in blunt trauma, gunshots, car accidents, whatever it is, um, that their heart stopped, full cardiac arrest, there was no outcome. Zero outcome of the CPR, as we know today. So, obviously, we do CPR in cardiac situations. Anything that has to do with a cardiac situation, non-trauma, put it this way, any non-trauma situation, we will treat full cardiopulmonary resuscitation, chest compressions, and everything. In trauma, the statistics are very much against us. So, while you're doing CPR, if you try and do CPR, in the hot zone, you may get shot. While you're getting shot, the mission either gets delayed or compromises the mission totally, and the patient you're trying to treat it will still stay dead. So, if there's a situation when the person is already in full cardiac arrest, maintain your security, complete the mission, there's probably nothing that you will be able to do for this patient. General Albert Sidney Johnston, um, famous from the Shiloh War, a battle in uh, 1862, he was Confederate uh, uh, general, um, he was killed in action. What was his story there? Just before the battle that he was uh, uh, involved in, the general uh, surgeon, David Yandel, had uh, uh, directed that every soldier carry a tourniquet with him. Every soldier should carry a tourniquet in his, in, the, in his vest pocket in order to stop bleeding from extremities in the battlefield. Um, general Albert Sidney was shot in the Publitelli artery, which is down by the leg, very big artery that can bleed massively, and he bled to death. When they were checking out his body, they found a tourniquet in his pocket. This may have been a preventable death. This, this is very important. The use of tourniquets um, 
have been extensively in the arena of tactical medicine, of combat medicine. Um, they're emphasizing the use of tourniquets extensively because this is a very simple treatment. It's literally, if I'll put it in simple words, we'll see an example of a tourniquet, but in very simple words, put a rope around the leg, tie it up very tight until the bleeding stops. Once the bleeding stops, the deterioration process of the victim will be maintained. So the American army, um, as well as all the other armies in the world almost, um, implement the use of tourniquets. And statistics from uh, the American army provided uh, from 2008, 2009, showed that over 2,000 lives of soldiers in Afghanistan and Iraq were saved by the use of tourniquets. This is why it's so important to use these tourniquets. So in the civilian arena, however, tourniquets, they tell you, wait, don't put on a tourniquet so fast. We're not so far from the hospital. We can put on a bandage, direct pressure on the wound, and take him to the hospital. There is risk for the limb um, uh, if you put on a tourniquet. So in the civilian arena, when you learn pre-hospital trauma life support by the Western standards, then you don't put on a tourniquet. However, when relating to a tactical arena, to a uh, military arena, combat field, you must use tourniquets. This is just one example of very simple tourniquets. There are many, many different models today on the market. Um, this is a, a, a tourniquet that a soldier can put on for himself or a law officer. Very simple use. Slip it on, twist the thing, and the bleeding stops. Very, very simple. Next, we said the biggest cause of death, over 60%, is hemorrhage. We've addressed the hemorrhage. Now we'll be relating to the tension of morthorox. This is a situation where there is a penetrating trauma to the lungs, therefore puncturing the lung. I won't go into the whole medical uh, issue of it, but if we can maintain the situation of the lungs, therefore preventing their collapse, then uh, um, we can save the 30% that we were talking about before, um, save these lives. Paramedics, doctors on the field can be easily trained with a, a, what's called needle application, needle th uh, It's a simple process of literally putting needles that have a, like a little tube in between the, uh, the ribs into the lung area, the punctured area, enabling the air to uh, come out but not come back in, enabling the lungs to stay open and maintain oxygenation of the patient. What do we do with IV fluids during uh, tactical medicine? In general, I don't know many uh, tactic medics or doctors that uh, carry IV fluids on them. It's not what will save the life at that moment. What we said saves the life is stopping the hemorrhage on the one hand or needle application on the other hand. The fluids can usually wait until we go into the second circle, into the tactical treatment. And if the patient is very unstable and you have the equipment, you may do it if the situation enables it. If there's gunshots going, you're not putting in an IV. You drag the patient out from the hot zone into the second zone where he can um, treat the patients. So, once again, um, tactic medics are trained in evidence preservation, weapons, um, weaponry. They are tactic team members, fully integrated tactic team members, because if there is no casualties during the incident, they're just another warrior as one of the other uh, warriors. They understand the equipment, they know how to plan their equipment appropriately, and uh, they can uh, treat the patients. Let's run through a little bit. Um, they're more aware of the different threats that, uh, that oppose them, um, whether it's the tactical threats or if you're going into uh, different uh, crime scenes, drug labs, chemical hazards. And of course, they're more aware than your civilian medical uh, provider not to get shot. So obviously, special tactics require special equipment. Just as an example of the uh, tourniquet that we, uh, we saw, they have special equipment that is uh, usually more compactable because, once again, this equipment needs to go on the combat uh, or fighter tactic unit member. Um, they pre-plan for the worst case scenarios and they know how to get in and get out. The warm zone is the second zone once the uh, gun fighting has stopped 
and uh, there they can do more extensive uh, treatment. There's a concept called scoop and run, meaning we're not going to treat this patient as if he was on the street, meaning a collar and a backboard and everything that has to do it, because now the life-threatening situation requires us to get him out of that zone and get the definitive care, because if he's alive and somewhat handicapped, he's better than dead. Um, so we scoop and run, we do ABC, the airway, basic airway, stop the bleeding, and try and get as fast as we can out into the safe area. Um, the equipment, this is a totally standard looking uh, tactical operation a team member. Uh, obviously, they have special equipment which we'll run through very briefly and I will be able to uh, address your questions. Um, they have their vest, protective vest, of course, bulletproof, whatever other team member has with a marking on them that they are the medical team member so that um, in visual contact they can see who they're dealing with if they need to call over immediately uh, the medical treatment. They have different uh, parts of equipment, um, collapsible uh, uh, bag valve mask, uh, uh, utilities, different tourniquets, all trauma supplies, and basically all go into a kit that may look big in the picture, but this kit basically goes down on their leg or on part of their kit on the back. Um, let's not forget, they're team members. So besides that, they carry their body armor, like I was saying, they carry a gun, um, spare magazines, just as every other team member. So a tactical medic or a tactical doctor going into a situation is packed with a lot of equipment and needs to be able to maneuver himself as part of the team. They have many times protective masks, for going in, whether they're using a, a sort of a basic a, a gas masks against tear gas or a, a different uh, situations. We were talking about chemical hazardous materials that, uh, that they may uh, need to work within their vicinity. The medical bag, different products which enable quick treatment, not needing to take a long time. We said the tourniquet. Uh, there's a small collapsible uh, uh, bag valve mask to ventilate the patient if he is, uh, needs a ventilation. There's uh, IVs, I said we don't do, but there is today what's called uh, IM, intramuscular. This is sort of a, you have a small picture there of a, like a small gun in your hand that you just put into the bone and uh, administer drugs that you may need to administer to the patient, life-saving drugs, directly into the bone, which has been proven clinically to be just as effective as IV. Um, I think that's about it. So let's just remember, very important is uh, bleeding wounds, breathing, broken bones we don't relate to when we're on the field. Obviously burns, there's not much we can do while we're being shot at and uh, we need to get out of there as fast as possible. This is really sort of the tip of the iceberg. Um, I would say that this uh, slide relates not only to tactical medicine, but to this whole workshop. Uh, and my colleagues as well that were presenting with me uh, got sort of the tip of the iceberg of uh, the different uh, uh, topics. All these topics can be addressed in depth, obviously, in future workshops and, uh, and uh, sharing knowledge in, in the future as well. Obviously, every country, every organization has their own special needs, unique needs, require um, unique solutions, um, and I think that, uh, I hope that, uh, I feel that, uh, that uh, I've learned a lot here, and uh, that uh, I see the interest um, within uh, you here. Uh, subject of tactical medicine, and what is, uh, what must have struck you as it has me, is the vast differences in approach, and um, uh, uh, one of the first being that uh, earlier when I said that it is integral to the operational forces, it, I didn't realize that it's psychologically also integrated. That is, one of their aims is uh, completion of the mission. So, although he's a medical aid provider or medical relief provider and even a lifesaver, the tactical consideration of the completion of the mission is also extremely important. And uh, certain other things were uh, eye-openers, such as the, uh, uh, such as the understanding or the acceptance that CPR is not to be done, that uh, 
24% of casualties on the battlefield are preventable. Now just imagine that, 24% is a huge number, are preventable. And simple things like tunicates and how many lives they save. And uh, these have given us flashes of insight into this whole vast new difference between the practice of tactical, tactical medicine and medicine as practiced in, in uh, the civilian uh, context. So this is something that those of us who are in command of forces, military forces or law enforcement forces uh, should, should really be looking at. In the military, of course, it has been uh, that the medical team has always been tactically part of incorporated with the, with the formations. But even then, it was defi definitely a rear echelon kind of involvement and, and not a frontline involvement. And here we have been, here we've been listening to frontline, that is the hot zone involvement. So, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mazel, for a very illuminating talk. And I now uh, throw the house open for questions and answers. Please identify yourselves, wait for the mic, and uh, then I will request Mr. Mazel to take address.